All right. So thank you for coming to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. How are you, sir? I'm very good today. And thank you for having me. Oh, more, most definitely. You are a legend and I am blessed to be in your presence right now. So I want to ask you, um, when exactly did you fall in love with wrestling? <laughs> I never fell in love with wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I fell in love with Tasha Long. She's my wife. All right. Uh, uh, here's the deal. Uh, I started 18, uh, 1982, 83. Uh, I started going down to the uh, TBS studios here in Atlanta, Georgia, and just watching the TV tapings on Saturday mornings. And uh, so one day I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. There was a wrestler that uh, wasn't familiar with Atlanta and he needed somebody to show him around. And so he just happened to start come up to me and start talking to me. And so I started showing him around. And on Saturday mornings, when he would come to the TV station for the TV taping, then he would always have me with him. And so that's how I got, I was able to get in the back where everybody was because I was with this guy. So by me being in the back and everything, you know, I just kind of minded my own business and I would find stuff to do, you know, to keep myself busy. And to make a long story short is uh, they uh, came up with, a, I was, first thing I was doing is I would go to the ring and get the, when the guys would take off their jackets and clothing I, and that gear, I would take it and bring it back to the locker room. Well, they kind of liked me for that because a lot of guys had been losing their gear. Nobody was picking it up. And sometimes the fans there would pick up the gear and wouldn't give it back. So they appreciated me for getting their gear. And so I started like running errands and stuff, you know, kind of like a gopher. And then uh, one day, day they had a job to come open and that job that came open was uh, they needed somebody to put up the ring, take the ring down. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. And uh, after I got that job, then I took the ring to uh, Marietta, Georgia one night and we were at the Cobb Civic Center. And I got the ring up and around showtime, there was no referee. The referee didn't show up. So the promoter came out and she said, Teddy Long, uh, you're going to have to referee tonight. So I said, I don't know anything about refereeing. She said, don't worry about it. Said, just get in there. The guys will talk to you. They'll take care of you. So I had my first match in uh, Cobb Civic Center. It was Black Bart and Ron Bass. And it was a Texas death match. And they were bleeding all over the place. And they scared me to death. Aww. So it, the first mistake I made is they scared me so bad, I jumped out of the ring and left them. Then I heard the guy that was ringing the bell, Charlie McGowan, he's yelling at me, get back in the ring, get back in the ring. So I finally got it together and I got back in the ring and I never forget, I, I, I heard Ron Bass say out of his mouth, I never, he said, dude, he told Ron Bass, he told Black Bart, he said, did you see what the referee just done? He just left us. <laughs> so ended up, I got back in the ring and I finished that match off, but that was the first match I had for Ron Bass and Black Bart. And that was how I started refereeing. So then my referee career went into uh, managing. And the way I got into that is I was riding with Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, uh, God rest his soul, and Kevin Sullivan. And I'll give you a little bit more about Kevin because me and Kevin, you know, I guess what goes around comes around. Me and him are, are back together, working together right now. But we'll talk about that a little later. But anyway, like I said, I was with Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, Kevin Sullivan, and my career was in radio. I was a disc jockey in Birmingham, Alabama at WJLD. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably don't remember none of this. You, wasn't, you probably weren't even born. Uh, but they had a station at WENN, when I worked at that radio station in Birmingham. So I was a disc jockey there. So I used to let Kevin and Eddie Gilbert know I could DJ. So while we were going up and down the road, we'd get the car and get a case of beer and we'd get to drinking and I started DJing for them. And they, saw, they found out that I could talk. And so they ended up getting me into managing. They went back and told the bookers that I could talk. And so after that, then that's how I ended up with, uh, let's see, I think the first person I had was uh, Johnny B. Bad. I had him, Mark Merrill. He was a guy that kind of looked like Little Richard. Yeah. And uh, I never will forget uh, the first night I met him and uh, Dusty Rose, God rest his soul. Dusty gave me my first job too, you know, I owe a lot to him. He gave me my first job as refereeing and then he did a whole lot for me, you know, after I start, you know, after we got together and I started doing a lot of other things. But anyway, Dusty was going to call Johnny B. Bad Tutti Fruity. And he come to me and he said, can you think of something else they could call me? He said, they want to call me Tutti Fruity. 
and he didn't like that. So we and him sit down. And I thought of this little thing. I said, all the fly guys will be mad and all the fly girls will be glad. Get ready for Johnny B. Bad. And that's what we went and told Dusty and he liked it. And that's how the name came about. That's how we started using that. And then I had Johnny B. Bad. I managed him. I had a, a lot of these guys I ain't going to even mention because a lot of people now probably don't even know them. But I'm trying to get back to some guys that people know. Uh, Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. I happened to be with them, the team of doom. And uh, we, 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 we run rush shot over everybody. The Steiners, we had a good, you know, great matches with them. Freebirds, Rock and Roll Express. Uh, Midnight Express, you know, we we went through them all. So we had a great and the Road Warriors. Don't um, let me leave them out. Simmons, um, Craig Pittman, Sergeant Craig Pittman, Ice Train, uh, Jesus Christ, I jump in Joy Bags. I had a lot of people. Then I had then I went to WWE and I started when, when I first went there. I started refereeing because Vince didn't really know me. And so I was just refereeing. And so I think they had a meeting one day and somebody told Vince what I could do. And that's how I ended up uh, starting managing in WWE. So I had Mark Henry, uh, Jazz, Rodney Mac, uh, and all these people I'm having, to, I'm working with right now. So it's just amazing how everything goes around in a circle. Yeah, it's funny because the first time I ever saw you, because uh, you did mention how I am young, I'm 27. So yeah. the first time I ever saw you, you know, you were managing for Rodney Mac and Jazz. And I remember seeing you and I was just like, man, he has a lot of style and a lot of attitude. <laughs> and well, yeah, well, that, so. that's my role, you know, that's what that was. And, and that's why I was able to, to work in WWE, WWE for a long, long time, because my character was basically me. You know, they just told told me what they kind of wanted. And so I come from the street. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I already had that swag. So I knew exactly, you know, what to do. So that's why I was so good at what I did because I was comfortable. It was me, you know, I wasn't putting on or trying to be something that I wasn't. So uh, yeah, I had a good time with Jazz and Rodney. And then, like I said, Mark Henry was part of that stable. Right. So we, we, we had a great run. Yeah, and it's so funny because I remember seeing you. I felt like it was kind of like a kindred spirit because it felt like I remember seeing, you know, men like that, you know, at church and sort of just hanging out, you know, at the barbershops and everything. So it <laughs> felt like when I saw you, I was just like, you know what? He seems like he would be a really cool dude in real life. So, <laughs> you know, I appreciate it, you know, seeing that, you know, growing up. And you mentioned, you know, how you worked as a DJ in Birmingham, which is also where I'm from. And yeah. when you mentioned WJLD, that's where my, my grandma used to listen to those church services they would do, you know, whenever she wouldn't feel like going to church, you know, physically, yeah. she would listen to church services on that radio station on the AM dial. Now, I'm not necessarily sure if they exist, you know, anymore, but you mentioned all of that. And I wanted to ask you, what were some experiences that you remember um, growing up in, here in Birmingham, sir? Well, uh, a lot of experience I remember growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, they wasn't really good because I was kind of a thug in Birmingham, Alabama. I was bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> in trouble all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> I'm just being straight up with you. I just stayed in trouble. But, you know, that come from, you know, my parents, uh, they died at a real young, well, when I was real young. So I didn't have a chance to, you know, grow up in a home, you know, where there was a mother and dad. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I really wasn't raised. So I had to kind of raise myself. So I went to the streets and that's what all I knew was the street. So, you know, that was the only way I knew how to survive. So by me not having any parents, you know, that played a lot. And so, but God blessed me to, you know, kind of get through a lot of things. And so right now, you know, here I am and I'm still alive. Yes, sir. And I'm glad to see that, you know, and I'm really happy that you have sort of lived your life as an example, you know, of rising from that and, you know, making and you being blessed for your life to be the, where it is. So I wanted to ask you, you know, as a referee, what was it like to sort of see matches, you know, in action? Because from the outside looking in, you're watching it as a viewer and as a fan. But what is it like, you know, refereeing and watching matches from the inside? Well, it's, it's really good because, you know, when you're in there, you know, everybody, you know, basically has to be on the same page. And uh, you know what I mean? You know, a lot of guys think just because the guy got on stripes, you know, he don't really have a hard job. Yeah, you got a hard job because you got to keep up with him. Uh, you got to be in the right place at the right time, you know, and you got to know what to do in certain situations. Uh, I remember one time I was refereeing uh, Spike Dudley. 
And uh, he threw this guy right outside and the guy was outside of the ring. And I looked at Spike and he says, what do I do next? And I just say, baseball slide. And I just, <laughs> and that's what he did. And he come back and he thanked me. He said, God, I forgot. I didn't know what to do out there, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the whole thing, you know, it's a job and every, you know, ain't, ain't no one single person in there. Everybody in there is a team and everybody needs to be on the same page. And if you got that, you know, you you got a good match, and I can give you an incident there, the 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 flare and steamboat thing, the shot down heat, where I was able to be a part of that. That was a big moment in my life. So I, you know, to to come down and do that, especially back in the day, then working with the top stars, you know, that that was really good. Okay, so did you ever imagine yourself, you know, being a manager when that idea was brought to you, or um, how did you feel when they brought that idea to you, sir? Well, um, the way I got that idea is I had um, Kevin Sullivan and uh, Eddie Gilbert, they went and took care of that. And they and the next thing, Jim Hurd at the time was a man that was in charge. So the next thing I knew, I mean, I didn't even know, you know, when they come and brought that to me, they told me, you know, they were going to start getting, starting me to manage. So they had me to go out and like scout and look at different talent. And then from that, then I, the first thing I did was did the heel turn where I turned on the road warriors and then I went bad. And then that's when they started me to managing. Mm -hmm. So at that particular time, you know, I really didn't have a clue about the wrestling business. You know what I mean? But I was just able to learn. So I was able to stay there and listen. So like I said, my gift of gab got me through. They already back then, you know, right now we have writers, you know, have people that write for us. Well, back then there were no writers. So they would just give you the points of what they wanted to talk about and you had to run with it from there. So I was able to ad lib and do a lot of the stuff on my own, which made it real easy for me. You know what I mean? Because I was just mm -hmm. giving a lot of playing from the street. And, uh, you know, it was just it was just a good time for me. You know, it was a big, you know, a lot on me. But, you know, like I said, the opportunity doesn't knock but once. So you got to know when that when that knock comes and you got to take advantage of it. And that's what I did. OK. So who was your favorite um, wrestler or favorite team to manage? Uh, my favorite team to manage was Butch and Ron. I, I, I had a lot of fun with them. You know, they were great, uh, especially with Butch. God rest his soul. He just mm -hmm. left us, you know, uh, God, because he was so comical. Boy, he, he was just a mess. And he was so serious, too. That was the funny part about it. And uh, I never, uh, here's a good Butch Reed story. I remember one night we wrestled in Boston, I believe it was. And so they had, after we were done, you know, Butch had got, on, got out of his wrestling gear and he, you know, put on his street clothes and put on cologne. You know, he's all ready to go to the bar. So they had me go rib him and they had me go tell him, Butch, somebody didn't show up and uh, Ron, you guys gonna have to work twice. Mm -hmm. So now he's really hot. He's cussing, I mean, he's hot, but you know, so I get away, so finally, he gets out of his out of his street clothes, puts on his wrestling gear, tapes his arms up. He's ready to go. And it's it's a rib. You know, they, it's a lie that I went and told him and he found out that I had ribbed him. So I, I had to stay away from him for about a week because he's going to kill me. Oh, wow. I mean, every arena I had to hide from him because he was looking for me. But until we went out, he wouldn't bother me out when we were out there. But he'd look at me. I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> but he was such such fun to be with and i had a chance to see him you know uh last year i think uh, we did a him and run and i did a, a a virtual signing and uh, uh autograph deal and uh we had fun with him butch hadn't changed he's the same old butch so uh but they were the you know good team i had to manage uh i had a decent good time with uh sid vicious and danny spivey at the skyscrapers at that time and uh, they were good, but, and then Undertaker came and replaced Sid, so I had Taker, and, well, he was mean Mark Callis then, and I had mm -hmm. him and Danny Spivey. Then Taker went to be a single mean Mark, so I managed him as mean Mark, and then he left w, uh, WCW, and he went to Vince, and who, I, I never thought I'd be there working with him all over again, and especially in a good big storyline that me and him had where he kidnapped me and all that <laughs> stuff, so just a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember that story. And that was during your time as the um, general manager of SmackDown, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so I want to ask you, what were some of your favorite moments from being the general manager of SmackDown? And you were pretty historic because you were the first black general manager WWE ever had. So what yes. were some experiences you had with that? And what was your favorite moments from that era? 
Well, my favorite moments was, uh, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, every last one of them, I had fun at everything that I did. You know what I mean? Because I was able to make Vince happy. And, uh, you know, like behind the scenes, they would always tell you, you know, man, you know, you, you ain't gonna get Vince. They said, if you can make Vince laugh, he, they said, you got it. And I had him busting out one day, man. So, you know what I mean? But, you know, just to know that I, you know, had him, you know, I didn't let that, I didn't take advantage of that. I still did my job. Mm -hmm. But the amazing time I had with Vicky Guerrero, those were good times where she, uh, I was pushing around in the wheelchair and they took over SmackDown and all that. That was great, great times there. Uh, like especially with the with the Taker deal, I had a great with the kidnapping and me in the coffin and all that stuff. That was a whole lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing that, so it didn't bother me at all. So like everything that I did on SmackDown, I enjoyed every moment of it. I remember Drew McIntyre. I was doing some stuff with him. He was the chosen one, and he had me crawling around on my knees in the ring, you know. And you know, the thing that really got me, I told him to mention something about my grandkids because every man loves his grandkids. And so I told him, say, say you're going to say something about my grandkids. So now that makes me turn around. Now I got to get humble. You know, don't mess with the grandkids or whatever you right. want to do. So it has to be real. You know what I mean? You have to, you know, let people give people life experiences, what they see and what they feel every day. And they and you'll touch them and they'll believe in you and they'll want to see you all the time because they know you're going to entertain them. They always waited on me because they know I'm coming to straighten it out. Right. And I feel like those are the best stories, you know, the ones that are taken, you know, where they take stuff from real life because those are the ones that resonate the most with audiences, I can say. So right. I, I really do, you know, appreciate those moments, you know, as a fan. And I really did love your run as the general manager. And I remember when Vicky Guerrero took over, I was so angry. I was just like, let Teddy Long do him. Like, let him, let him be in charge. Like, stop trying to take a take but, stuff away from him. <laughs> that's how that was supposed to go. You yes, know what I mean? I know. <laughs> you know, take take the good times away from you and make you star. Wait on it. You know, well, please mm -hmm. bring him back. Please, you know, and that's how you know we made that work. Cause some of the stuff that Vicky did to me, I told her to do it. Right. You know what I mean? I said, hey, why don't you do this? You know, and I and I'll be looking mean at you. You know, and don't worry. You know, cause I could do. I could do stuff, you know, with facials. Vince McMahon always told me that the money was right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sometimes I could make expressions. I wouldn't have to say nothing. You could see it in my face, you know? Right. So, you know, and that's, I was, I, I understood what my job was. So that's why I tried every night that I walked out, I intended to give it 100%. Yes, and then that led to you being inducted into the Hall of Fame. So, and I also saw that you were inducted into the NWA Hall of Fame as well. So- well, I, they never told me nothing about the NWA Hall of Fame. I, oh, I, really? I to attend that, and nobody never told me nothing about that. So that's that's one on me. I didn't even know <laughs> that. Okay. Well, let's just talk about the WWE Hall of Fame. How did you feel when they um gave you the news that you were going to be inducted? Well, you know, it, it was really a big surprise to me because with me, the way I looked at the Hall of Fame, you know, that was for wrestlers, you know, and people that mm -hmm. have, you know, took a lot of bumps and put their bodies on the line every night. And, you know, people, you know, I thought, you know, that busted their butts, you know, to make this business what it is. And, you know, they deserve that, you know. And so I just never did look at myself like that. You know, I just knew I did my job. But, you know, to get that call from Vince and he told me that, you know, was that let me knew too that I was appreciated and I did my job and he and, and uh, I made him happy so that was a great honor for me because I I never would have dreamed it I never would even thought of it. in fact I didn't even think about it no more you know so it was really a big surprise to me and you know like I said let me thank Vince McMahon and the McMahon family because like I said they believed in me you know when a lot of people in WCW didn't believe in me and it wasn't because it was me it was because of you know I'll just be straight up which it was the color of my skin Mm -hmm. But God brought me through all that, you know what I mean? So I put that all behind me because that doesn't get us anywhere talking about the past, you know, well, let's live in the future. So like I said, I was able to overcome all the obstacles and uh, make it for 15 years I was there. I had a great run. I worked on top the majority of the time I was there, even when I was a, a heel manager. All I right. still worked on top. I did the white boy challenge, you know, and I did the thing with Jerry Lawler where I told him he was just another cracker with a crown. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so you know, we just, you know, everything I did, I had fun, man, with it. And so I made it work. So, and Vince was happy. And as long as the boss was happy, then I was, every, everything was cool with me. And the Hall of Fame, I thank them. And I especially thank all the fans for people that I entertained and people that liked me. Because without them, I wouldn't have never made it to the Hall of Fame. So I just thank everybody, all the people that are watching your podcast. You know, thank all you guys for everything. Thank you. Yes. So is it true that Ron, when Ron Simmons and JBL inducted you into the Hall of Fame, is that all those stories they told about you not really paying for anything? Was that all true? Uh, pretty much true. Because <laughs> I because I remember when they said that, I was like, well, whoa. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm El Chipo. I can tell you that right now. But, um, you know, see, if you've been in the wrestling business for a long time, you know, you have to be cheap because, see, back back in the day when we started in this business, you had to drive. You know, you had to figure that gas money out. And you had to figure that money out that you're going to go in there and buy your loaf of bread and some lunch meat so you can have some food to eat while you're driving. Mm -hmm. uh, where you going to stay tonight? The cheapest, a red roof. You know, you got to figure out the cheapest hotel because that's how you had to survive. You didn't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I came up through that era. So when I started making money, you know, I started putting up saving, you know, like I'm saying, I ain't, I'm, my thing was I ain't gonna be broke no more. Right. <laughs> yeah. I feel that. And what's so funny is from the outside, you sort of think that, you know, since you're seeing them on TV, you think they're living in a lap of luxury, but in actuality, there's yeah. a lot going on. You know, they're trying to make ends meet just like we are on the outside. Right. I guess, yeah. And, and, and that's why, that's another thing too. I'm glad you brought that up because, TV, you know what I mean? A lot of people look at that the wrong way. They think oh, they see somebody on TV, they're making millions and millions of dollars. You know, it don't work like that. There's a, but like when we bring people in, there's a SAG fee. There's a certain fee that you pay. They might, the, the highest some of them get maybe 750 <laughs> You know what I right. mean? But you, your, your plane and your hotel, all that, you know? So, you know, it, so it ain't no whole lot of money, man. So people have to watch that. I look at, look at Google. If you Google my net, my net on Google says that I'm worth three million dollars. Can you believe that? Three million. That's what they're saying about me. And that's pretty bad because they could get me robbed. Somebody could come to my house thinking that I'm really worth three million dollars and right. could, could, could hurt me and my family. Right. So you know, how, can they put, how can you put something out like that? Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. You have to be careful. You know what I mean? Because like I just you just can't believe half of this stuff that's all i tell you i'm not worth three million y'all i'm telling you yeah well <laughs> i want to ask you um in your view how has the world of wrestling changed you know for the better um in terms of what you've seen because i know you've seen a lot and you've seen it go through a lot of ebbs and flows so how has well, the wrestling business changed well i think the wrestling business changed after covid i think that changed the whole entire world you know, after, you know, we were not able to really entertain the live audience, you know, you didn't got 50,000 or 70, 80,000 people there screaming and yelling. You know what I mean? That's that's what has changed. That's what you miss. You know, nothing's wrong with the virtual, but it's just not like that live audience. Right. And also, the other thing I think now is that the, it's not the attitude era anymore. It's not what I experienced. You know what I mean? I went through the hardcore part where you had to get down, you know, and tell stories, you know, and make people believe, you know, and gave them a good show. And, you know, like I said, things are good now, you know what I mean? But in my opinion, I think that they, they could be a lot better. Oh, definitely. There's always room for improvement. And I definitely agree with that. But I know I am really happy, you know, that a lot of these wrestling promotions have, you know, turned everything around and figured out how to entertain us in the midst of the pandemic. But I do miss going to live shows because I've been to about 20 in my life. So, you know, I really do miss it when the shows do come here because it's a it's a fun time. I love well it. And, and like you said, you mentioned a lot of promotion that turned things around. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a company now. It's called SWE Fury. Yeah, I see it on your shirt. We're, we're based, yeah, we're based out of Texas and we're live. We're on the CW network. We're on a lot of TV stations, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and I think we're in Jacksonville, Florida. So what we're doing in SWE, we're taking you back, you know what I mean, to the old school. It's old Texas style wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh had mark henry to come in for a couple of shows in fact we just did some, some this past weekend called wrestle fest mark henry was there to help us out uh mark's gonna start coming in and work behind the scenes you know and do some stuff for us and help with the young talent 
uh, Kevin Sullivan. I throw you bring him back. He's uh, doing the color commentating. Plus him and I are doing the, the, the booking part of it. And uh, we've been had great shows and we have great crowds. You can pull us up on YouTube and go to our SW page and you can look and see where we just had a sellout crowd, thousand people just the other night. And like I said, with Texas, you know, the people wear the mask, you know, and like I said, some people, you know, they just don't believe this stuff. So, but I believe it. So, you know what I mean? So I just keep my mask on and wash my hand and try to stay safe. But, you know, if people want to come out, you know, if there's no law saying that they can't do it, then they're going to come out. So, you right. know, you just, but you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's every man for himself, but uh, I'd like for everybody to watch SWE. Like I said, you can pull us up on YouTube. We have a Facebook page and you can see all the great stuff we're doing. we got a show coming up March the 20th. We'll be in Canton, Texas. It's called Clash, uh, the Clash in Canton. Uh, Charlie Haas is there. He's our world heavyweight champion. Rodney Mack is oh, the wow. uh, TV champion. And uh, we just crowned the OMGs. I don't know if you ever heard these uh, or any guy. They're the new uh, SWE Tag Team Champion. And they're some brothers, and they're funny. As, you know, they're really great. So, uh, like I said, I'm just having fun in SWE. And uh, if y'all want to holler at a player, find Teddy Long, then that's where I'm at. All right. You know, it's good to hear that Charlie Haas is doing good because I haven't seen him since he was in the tag team with Shelton Benjamin back yeah, in the day. Well, yeah. <laughs> You know, well, after, you know, Charlie and his brother were tag teams at one time, you know, and Charlie's brother died and mm -hmm. that kind of took a lot out of Charlie. So Charlie just kind of faded out. But now he's back. You know, he's teaching a wrestling camp and uh, he, he's got his kids with him and everything. So and he's just happy now to be our champion. Uh, we just had a match this past uh, Saturday night. We were trying to go live on Facebook with our show, but we just started having problems. But. If you can get the YouTube match with Charlie Haas and EPM Sim, boy, you they tore the house down. You you'll see you'll see what you saw when you was growing up. Okay. Right. So um you've basically mentioned, you know, everything that you're doing now. And so what do you believe the future holds for you, Miss uh, Mr. Long? Well, uh my thing is this, you know, I'm just I'm kind of working at my own pace now. I love what I'm doing. I'm kind of like my own boss, you know what I mean? So I ain't stressed out like, you know, trying to catch a flight and ripping and running and driving trying to make it to the next town. You know, every time I leave home though, I think I'm like, "Ah, oh, here we go again." You know, <laughs> stranded in the airport waiting to fly. I mean, that 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 it was a lot of stress, you know what I mean? And it was really, really demanding because you in WWE, you got to be there. You got to be there. They don't mm -hmm. want to hear that mess about what happened over here, what happened over there. This, you got to be there. So right now, you know, I'm I'm just giving, you know, what I've learned back to the young talent. Uh, these people at SWE, I had a chance to talk to them and they brought me in to help them and, uh, you know, not blowing my own horn. But since I've been there, things have certainly turned around for them. Uh, houses are, are, you know, our attendance is great. Our TV ratings are up. And so they're happy and I'm happy. So my future is just to give my knowledge to anybody that I can and to help and just do what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, like I said, I'm working at my own pace. I'm my own boss. And when you can be your own boss, you know, you don't get no better than that. Right. Hopefully one day I'll get to that point. But we'll you see. <laughs> All right. Well, Teddy Long, thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. I've enjoyed talking with you and spending time with you. And just tell the people where they can follow you on social media and, and online and all of that. All right. Let me see here. I'm going to have to look on some of my stuff myself. It's bad when you don't know your own stuff. Okay. On my Twitter, it's uh, at Teddy Player Long. Uh, Facebook is TeddyLong.com. And Instagram is Teddy Player Long. That's at Teddy Player Long, Twitter, TeddyLong.com, Facebook, and Teddy Player Long on Instagram. All right. Thank you so much for being an inspiration and for working um, in wrestling and working to make it better, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you something, too. And uh, I want to thank you for having me. And I want you to know I don't do podcasts anymore. And the reason why I stopped doing it is because the last one that I did, somebody said, edited something and put something out that I didn't say. Mm -hmm. And it caused a whole, you know, a lot of arguing. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if that's how these guys are going to be, then I'm done with it. Oh, so, but for you, there was just, just something about it. I said, let me do this podcast. And also let me plug my own podcast too. Uh, it's going to be starting. It's called Hold On A Minute Play Up. That's my podcast, and we're going to restart. We've already filmed, you know, already taped some good episodes, so it's going to be, we're going to be releasing those around the end of March. So it's Hold On A Minute Player. That's my podcast. But like I said, I wouldn't do, I don't do it for nobody, but it was just something 
that Birmingham, Alabama got me. Yeah. So I, <laughs> so I, I did this for you and I don't do them anymore. I'm telling you. Well, I really appreciate it, sir. I'm so glad you were able to come on. And hopefully one day you'll come back to Birmingham, you know? Well, the- you never know. We, well, you, SWE may be in Birmingham because I think that uh, Mississippi and uh, Alabama may be picking us up. So you never know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. All right. Thank you. And goodbye. Have a good day. You too. All right.